Welcome back, guys. Again, this is Dr. Severin. Uh, this is the final chapter um, or final part of our uh, lecture on sleep. And in this unit, we'll go over some of the assessments uh, that we can make for sleep quality, as well as some of the physiological processes that may be occurring as, during sleep to look at uh, whether or not someone has a sleep disorder uh, like obstructive sleep apnea or narcolepsy or excessive daytime sleepiness, different stuff like that. So the gold standard for assessing sleep is sleep polysmagography, uh, which is commonly known as a sleep study. Uh, during this, they pretty much assess everything. So we're looking at the EEG, which is the brain waves, EMG for looking for muscle activity, remembering that does change during sleep. Uh, you also have uh, electrooculography, looking at the, rap the eye movements. Again, we know that's gonna change during sleep. Uh, the ECG, looking at the heart rate, we know that's gonna change during sleep. Um, we'll look at airflow to see like, you know, what's uh, you know, moving in and out of the chest. So we can look at uh, these elastic belt sensors um, here to look at, you know, chest displacement to see, you know, are they breathing and what's the pattern of breathing. Um, and then we can look at uh, uh, respiratory effort kind of tied to that as well, or EMG activity to the, the, the intercostal to diaphragm through surface EMG, and then pulse oximetry. Do we see you know, the, the hemoglobin saturation uh, drop? And again, remembering that different stages of sleep will have different qualities. We can determine whether or not someone's falling in you know, the, the right you know, amount of uh, time in each stage, or, or are, they, are they actually cycling through these stages, right? So, um, and we often will place a little nose sensor too to see um, you know, airflow through the nose um, as well. So we can look at you know, chest displacement for effort, um, you know, how, how patterns are breathing as well as are they breathing effectively through their nose um, as well. Um, so the simultaneous uh, measurement, uh, it's really, really effective for looking at uh, sleep apnea because we can see how many periods of time where their chest doesn't move, right? Where they have these apneic periods where there's no, or where there's no airflow coming into the chest. Do they go through a desaturation? Um, so patients who, again, have that you know, poor sleep quality, um, they're reporting frequent snoring or their partners are reporting frequent snoring or they're gasping at night probably should be getting a sleep study and, and get that objectively assessed to see, hey, like, are you, are you going through with sleep apnea? Because sleep apnea can, can kill you in your sleep. There's countless famous uh, athletes and actors um, who, who die of this um, every year, Reggie White being a famous one. Um, and then uh, multiple sleep latency tests, or MSLT, uh, this is one of your go-tos for looking at narcolepsy. Basically, uh, it's an objective measure of sleepiness throughout the day. So uh, what we'll do is we'll see you know, how quickly it takes for them to fall asleep. So we'll set them up into a room. We'll hook them up to a, um, in, you know, a um, EEG and see how quickly they go to bed, right? Again, um, patients with narcolepsy, there's a very short latency period. Remember, um, you know, we're looking for about 20 minutes you know, if it's 10 minutes, not a super big concern, but if it's like less than five and they're falling asleep almost immediately, that's not a good sign, especially if that's something that happens chronically, where you, you're out immediately. Um, and they have uh, at least uh, two um, sleep onset REM periods during those kind of episodes. So again, that's um, related to some of the, the uh, uh, catatonia that we see during patients with narcolepsy. They kind of go out and they have this catatonia that, that, that uh, occurs. Um, one of the, again, those are very instrumented. You have to go to a sleep lab or sleep clinic um, to get assessed. And usually a physician is going to do that. In the clinic, there are um, standardized measures that we can utilize. Probably the one that you'll see most often is a Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index or PSQI. Um, it's one of the gold standard measurements. Um, it assesses several domains of sleep, subjective sleep quality, the amount of sleep, percent of time you spend in bed. So we're looking at sleep efficiency, uh, daytime dysfunction, looking at hypersomnolence. Are they having to use sleep medications, which can indicate maybe they got some issues with sleep quality? Are they having disturbances? And what's their latency period, which kind of ties into insomnia? So it's it's a great full spectrum assessment because it looks at multiple different domains and multiple different maybe signs um, of someone having a, you know uh, a sleep disorder or really significantly impaired or poor quality sleep. I also have several cutoff scores. So for each, um, there's a, a very instrumented way to calculate this. Uh, basically, the client self-rates themselves in different areas of sleep, seven areas, uh, which we have highlighted here. Um, and 
a scale from zero to three where a scale of three, right, reflects a n extreme negative, right? So zero is no problem, the three is being like super bad problem. An overall sum score greater than five, right? So if you're at a one for five of these, right, um, five or greater, so a score of five or greater, which factors in all seven, indicates you're, you had a poor sleep quality. And I've seen some scales, uh, you know, in the 17s, you know, like pretty high. Um, and yeah, again, it, you know, zero to three for each one of these, and then um, you're summing the total for each of these seven domains. And if they have a total score greater, let me, greater or equal to five, right? So meaning they can have a one in a couple areas, um, you know, indicates uh, poor overall sleep, but you can look at each subgroup and see, you know, you know, which one's worse than the other, right? So again, great, great assessment, super easy to kind of use. You gotta do some calculations, but it gives you some great data. Um, this came from the Singerson paper, which was published again in PTJ in 2017. Fast, fantastic paper. Uh, the podcast that we did with um, her cardiopulmonary PT journal. Uh, Katie's uh, at the University of Kansas uh, Medical Center. Fantastic sleep researcher for PT. Um, fan, uh, just fantastic sleep researcher overall. Um, she provided some just general interview questions. So you maybe don't have to do a full PSQI. Um, you know, if you, you know, because it does require some calculations you have to do on your own, but I, I, I prefer that. But if, you, if you're strapped for time, you can just ask these basic questions. How much sleep do you typically get? Do you feel well rested? So looking at right off the bat, quantity, quality, um, impact of your sleep is your, you know, how's your condition impacting your sleep? How would you overall weight your sleep quality? You know, does it impact your day-to-day -day functions? Do you have difficulty falling asleep looking at latency? Do you snore loudly looking again at um, OSA, looking again at um, restless leg syndrome? Do you have these strong urge to, mo to move? So if you just can go through, you know, overall quality time, looking at efficiency, then getting into que some more specific questions, like do you, you know, wake up or have, or, you know, have difficulty falling asleep looking at insomnia, probably our most biggest concern. Do you have difficulty breathing when you sleep or do you snore loudly looking at, you know, sleep apnea? And then the rest is leg syndrome, right? Do you have issues with um, moving on your legs? And then looking at hypersomnia, right? Like narcolepsy, do you feel sleepy throughout the day? So looking at, you know, excessive sleepiness disorders. So if you can get like, you know, those four basic efficiency questions done and, you know, quality questions and then four tailored questions to more specific disorders, right? You can get some pretty good data and then, you know, refer that patient to maybe get a sleep study um, to get that more further assessed. Usually a pulmonology clinic is where they'll go uh, to get those uh, uh, more objective um, lab-based lab diagnostic tests, like a sleep study um, or MLS, MSLT. Um, so um, her work kind of identified as well that, um, you know, and it was from that paper, uh, a survey was published in 2015 of practicing PTs um, who reported that, you know, most of us realize that sleep issues affect PT outcomes. I think we have a good understanding of that. However, the majority of them did not receive any education about sleep. Um, again, like I kind of, kind of again, here we go again with nutrition, you know, cardiovascular management. Like there's a big problem. I think we all understand how much these impact um, our outcomes. I think we, you know, just, you know, we're all trying to be healthier people as PTs um, and, we, we realize that if you're not resting well, it's gonna impact everything that we do, whether it's a patient with chronic pain, a patient with spinal cord injury, a patient with, you know, pediatric patient, right? Like, um, but we don't, we don't teach entry-level PTs about it. And there's, you know, not a lot out there yet um, to train people on the post-professional side. So hopefully you guys will have this information and kind of um, can utilize it, you know, in practice. So. Um, okay, we covered the overall um, things to assess for. Now let's get into some th ways to improve your sleep or general recommendations we can give. So you can follow these yourself because um, I know sleep is important for everybody and you know, students may have some issues too, right? So um, you know, useful for you and your patient. So recommendations to improve sleep, uh, the, probably the biggest thing, sleep is a behavior, right? And it's behavior we do every often. You could think of sleep as an ADL, but um, get, get into a routine sleep-wake schedule. Like, you know, again, it's all about keeping that balance, that process S, process C, keeping everything kind of in balance and, and, and regulated. Um, get, it up, get up 
the same time every morning, including weekends. Try to not sleep in. Maintain a regular schedule of going to bed and when you wake up. Like I, you know, I try to get to bed at 10 o'clock and wake up at six every day. Um, it's the same thing you would do with exercise or eating. Consistency is key. Um, and the, it's key for sleep too. We're creatures of habit, right? The more we kind of get into these routines, the, the better off our sleep will be and the easier it will be for us to get kind of back on the wagon if we fall off the wagon acutely with maybe an acute disturbance of sleep. Same kind of concept with anything, right? Uh, if you've got this foundation. And similarly too, if you, you know, if you've got, if you're, if you're in a bad cycle, it's gonna lead, it's just gonna perpetuate if you don't break it. Uh, develop a relaxing bedtime routine. We talked about the importance of limiting that that blue light exposure. So we can do in the, in in in, um, in exchange for that. Maybe you know take a warm bath, read a book, meditate, stretch, like something that's you're not going to be looking at a screen a lot. Um, you know you want to avoid vigorous exercise at least three hours before you go to bed because you're you're going to kind of be ramped up. You don't want to like work out and fall right asleep. Anyone who's ever done that knows like it's super hard to fall asleep if you work out an hour before. Um, you know, and reading a book can be great because you're, you know, you're reading, which is always good, but you're not looking at a screen. Um, and I know that's not easy to do. Um, the other big one that comes right from um, her recommendations is use your bed only, and, and, and this is everywhere too, use your bed only for sleep and sexual activity um, to help train your bed that if you, you know, if you're in your bed, if you're in your bedroom, that you're sleeping. You're not using it for eating, for working, or watching TV. Again, we're creatures of habit. If we associate you know, TV, if we associate eating, we associate working with our bedroom, um, when we're in there, it's gonna be harder for us to kind of switch that, those processes off. So, I mean, I don't keep a bed, I don't, I don't keep a TV in my bedroom, I don't keep anything in there. It's really just a bed, some, you know, low stim kind of, you know, light. You can use your aromatherapy if you want. Like, do not, like, don't do anything in your bed besides really sleep. It's the same kind of thing we do with, with um, eating, right? You don't, want to eat in front of the TV because you associate watching TV with eating. If you are doing work and watching TV in your bed, you're not associating your bed with just sleep. You're associating with, you know, you'll, you'll be compelled, right? You'll get the urge to want to watch TV or look at your phone. Like try to avoid doing those things. Get in the habit, you know, of setting this routine, only associating your bed with sleep and, you know, doing what you do in your bed, all right? Um, I do want to comment too, there are, um, Right now, there's insufficient evidence to recommend using a wearable device to give you any you know, really re valid or reliable information. It's just still kind of new. Um, you know, there's 80 sleep tracking apps and sensors. Um, you know, I, I think only one right now has been validated for a clinical trial. There's a ton of, I mean, there's a ton of apps. I mean, there's just, they're, they're not as valid, um, the apps especially, than the devices. Um, so if you do use them, just know that there are going to be some limitations to what they're going to tell you. So just be mindful of that. Right? If you want to use them, go ahead, but there's going to be some limitations. Um, yeah, the next one would be to the, a sleep environment, right? So um, again, like I mentioned, your sleep, like when you when you go to sleep, your body is starting to, should be starting to kind of cool down. So if your temperature in your room is super high, it's going to actually make it very uncomfortable um, and make it very hard to fall asleep. Um, so you should keep your temperature around 60 to 65. It's maybe different for every individual. I prefer a little bit cooler room um, when I'm sleeping. Um, but again, if it's, you know, if it's too high, generally it, it raises your body temperature and our body is associating cooling temperatures when we move into deep sleeps and then warming temperatures, remember, as we ramp back up into arousal and wakefulness. So if our room is really hot, our body's gonna be hot. It's gonna be harder for us to kind of, our brain to process, hey, I'm supposed to actually be, you know, asleep because it, it, it's really warm. Um, avoid loud noises and bright lights. Can be tough depending on where you're at, but blackout curtains can be great if you can afford them. Um, or even just a sleep mask. Um, you know, try to limit the amount of lights in your room because again, like those photosensors, right, in your eyes, like, you know, from the retinas go right to the SCN. And that's how we associate, you know, trying to coordinate wakefulness um, with daytime and, and sleepiness with nighttime, limited light, right? So just bear that in mind. Comfortable mattress, right? It's, the right one's gonna be the right one for you, right? So I don't really have any recommendations of that, but you're gonna have a comfortable mattress, something that, you know, supportive, you feel, you feel comfortable in. 
um, in light bed clothes and pajamas or no pajamas, right? Again, like keeping your body temperature cool during sleep is really important. Maybe you want to use a fan or something to kind of keep yourself cool. Because again, your body your, your, your associates cooler body temperatures with sleeping and warmer body temperatures with arousal and, and, and uh, waking up. So um, try to limit the, the heavy bed clothes and pajamas. And it's a great... Um, this is a great recommendation here, or a little infographic from the National Sleep Foundation. Fan, great website too. Um, but you know, dimming the lights, you know, keeping your room relaxed and peaceful. Don't have, keep your room organized and clean. Like you know, it's it's great. It's crazy. All the recommendations your parents give you, like you know, turn off your TV, read a book, you know, brush your teeth, you know, um, go to the bathroom. We'll talk about that one in a bit. Um, you know, and keep your room clean. Right? Like if your room is really disorganized, it kind of feeds into anxiety, which may make it harder for you to fall asleep. And so a cluttered room is not a good, not a good room for falling asleep. Keep your room clean and fold your bed. Um, and the recommendations to improve sleep, again, some dietary things, right? Don't eat a large spicy meal right before you go to bed. It can lead to indigestion. You know, when your, your digestive system slows down when you sleep, which, um, you know, if you're eating a really spicy meal, it can you know, stimulate acid secretions, cause heartburn and disturb your sleep and lead to, you know, you know, GERD and Barrett's esophagus. Um, a light snack might be helpful, something super light, not really acid heavy or really greasy, um, you know, or you don't, you don't want anything super heavy. Uh, you also want to uh, avoid excessive liquid consumption, two, three hours as well, just so you don't produce a lot of urine, which is going to wake you up. Um, and in kids, maybe, you know, wetting the bed or someone with incontinence could be a, bit, be a big problem. So you don't want to drink a ton of liquid right before you go to bed. Never a good idea. Uh, avoid caffeine for at least three hours. I'd even say even push it further. Some people say six hours, um, but three hours at minimum. Um, it's really, you know, caffeine stays in your system for about 24 hours. The, the effects wear off, but it's still in your system. So if you're chronically drinking a lot of caffeine, you're going to have some problems falling asleep because it doesn't clear completely out, at least for at least another day. Um, when we do our testing lab. We have people go off caffeine for at least 24 hours. Uh, alcohol, at least for four hours. We talked about like, Again, what can happen with the upper airway structures, the risk for aspiration. Um, you know, drinking a lot of red wine, you can have maybe um, you know, issues with, with GERD as well, too. Um, you can have an aspiration, so just be careful with that. Um, and alcohol can increase the number of times you wake up. Um, so, like, really don't, 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 again, you know, use alcohol as a sleep agent. It's really not, you shouldn't be using it for that. Um, you know, it can even wake, cause you to wake up early, right? So just be careful of that. And avoid things that trigger or worry your anxiety. Again, I talked about having a clean and ordered room as much as you can. Because um, if you have a disordered room that feeds into your anxiety, so keep keep your room clean. Listen, to, you know, remember your your, your parents' recommendations. Um, but you know, you know, I think people use this term, the Sunday night scaries or Monday night scaries. You know, I'm not too familiar with that term, but it's out there. Um, but people often, again, if their if their minds are racing, they're they're, they're perseverating on something, maybe it's work-related, unpleasant tasks, maybe they watched a really scary movie, it's gonna make it hard for you to fall asleep, your mind's gonna be racing. Um, you know, and uh, you know, a lot of sleep is trying to you know, you know, bring down, down-regulate, right, those, that neural communication, if your mind's moving a, a mile a minute, it's gonna make it hard for you to kinda move in that tranquil sleep state. So you, you can reduce that um, by Again, we talk about keeping things organized, or if you want, make a list. Make a list of things that you need to do the next day. Uh, maybe even lay out your clothes for the next day. Just get prepared. Like do things that you can control. Um, you know, keep your room clean, organized, stay organized. You know, good for your mental health, good for your sleep health. Um, you know, and maybe just, just keeping a written list of your worries and crossing them out that might help too. Um, but if you're having like longer issues, maybe seek a mental health counselor. That could be something very useful. So in summer here, again, be a PT in the, in the community, not just a clinic. I've got some great um, people I'd recommend following. Again, Katie, she's fantastic. She's very active on Twitter. Um, Michael Gradner and Craig uh, Gampari, they're physicians, are great uh, researchers in this domain. And then these are some of the uh, primary societies that you want to follow for sleep education. So uh, that was sleep, uh, health, and hygiene in a nutshell. I hope you guys found this stuff useful. And uh, we're looking forward to talking about this um, in our live session. Take care, guys. Thank you.